Hey, welcome back, uh, everyone. Uh, after um, lunch and preceded by two really super talks, uh, I'm delighted that our third our, our third talk is given by Raffaella Campaner, uh, who um, whose work, like indeed the work of uh, other speakers, I, I have uh, long uh, admired. Um, you, you'll know Raffaella; she's, she's a philosopher of science and and of medicine who studied in Trieste, I think, and, and indeed St Andrews, uh, and then moved to Bologna where she's been ever since, I think. Um, um, and um, I remember early on in that, in that career, um, she was uh, assistant editor of the British Journal for the Philosophy of Science, a very fine thing indeed. Uh, and I remember receiving emails from her asking me to review things or telling me that my papers had been rejected um, and things like that. Um, still, uh, we're good friends and I'm, I'm really pleased that she's, she's uh, talk, uh, talking to us uh, today about you know, what philosophy in medical education. So, uh, Rafaela, over, over to you. Thank you very much. I'm really, really very grateful for the uh, invitation. So please let me start by thanking both Alexander and Ariet. I'm really happy to be here. So thanks a lot. I feel honored about being part of this uh, workshop. Um, let me also mention that my talk will have both some intersections, some overlappings at this point and some differences uh, with the two which uh, preceded me and which I must say I much enjoyed. Um, if I may just start with a very short and maybe silly comment, I think that the, the, the lesson I've learned from this morning is that actually uh, we might have pretty different views between what philosophy in the first place is about and uh, also about what medicine uh, overall is, um, is about. And I might also um, start by admitting that my presentation started from an assumption, which being an assumption might be totally wrong, namely that uh, let's say all of us, or at least most of us, believe that it is a good thing to have philosophy in medical education. And then we must, might uh, discuss at the end of the workshop if we still uh, and all believe it is, um, it is the case, it is so. So what will I start to, what, what will I uh, try to, to do in my talk? I will just have a very short introduction. I will just mention some, some literature. Uh, I believe that the old discussion about the role of philosophy has, might have, should have in, in medicine has actually uh, gone on for, for a while. So um, it has become sort of maybe more popular, more, more, more trendy recently, but actually the old uh, debate has been going on for quite some, some time, for quite so, some, some decades. Uh, I will then try to say something about why philosophy in medical education, addressing some theoretical aspects, and I must say that there were a few issues which were particularly interesting in uh, Alex's paper. Um, I will then move on to provide some, re to suggest some reflections on empirical aspects, and maybe this part is going to be slightly closer to um, the first paper, the one by, by Juliet, uh, I will provide a few examples on the actual situation in Italy, and I must say, I'm very sorry to have to say that we are still pretty much behind. Hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Um, and then we also, though, try to present some interdisciplinary uh, initiatives we, we've had. It's not going to be an exhaustive list, obviously, but hopefully uh, those might provide us with some interesting hints on, on what philosophy might be like in medical education. Um, so this part is going to be pretty much practical, empirical, so as I was saying, in basically in, in line with uh, Juliet's paper, so not very much philosophical, but as I was saying, very, very uh, practical. Um, and then in the last part, I tried to suggest what should come next. Um, and there, I'm not really putting forward any particular view. Uh, what I would like to do is basically um, advance some further questions in order to stimulate some, some debate. So we just try to put on some uh, provoking thoughts, which in a way connect to Alex's um, paper, but basically I think in a different, uh, might, might lead us in a different uh, direction. So what is a, a, a issue here if we want to uh, address the topic of philosophy in medical education? At the end of the day, I think that in very general terms, what we have to start with is 
uh, reflecting over what we think the relation between philosophy and medicine is. And this, I think, has already been emerging um, during the morning, both in the talks and in the question time. And as I was mentioning, the debate has been going on for a few decades. And I would just like to start by um, quoting a couple of sentences from a paper which was written back in 1994 uh, and which was entitled Philosophy and its Role in Medicine, Inaugurating a New Section that was published in Theoretical Medicine. And on the one hand, the author says, medicine without philosophy is unthinkable. Indeed, an evolutional human occupation, explicitly or tacitly, must be underwritten by some sort of philosophy. And that is presented, that is defined, namely, by an inquiry, and Alex was mentioning inquiry, into what are its underpinnings, goals, aims, and aspirations, which are quite different things. However, um, at the same time, he also stresses that physicians often see medicine as a purely technical occupation and can make little of the term philosophy of medicine, on the one hand. And on the other hand, we have philosophers who, likewise, often feel that medicine is a merely technical discipline and that its philosophy is somehow not worthy of serious attention. And that were some of the claims which were made uh, more than two decades ago. So to, to, to start with, uh, I don't think, so if I, if, if I must say what I think one of the hopefully take home lessons my paper would like to have to, to, to give is that we cannot be discussing the role of philosophy in medical education without engaging into a very deep and constructive uh, relations with medical doctors themselves. So it cannot be a philosophical discussion just on, on, on the philosophical side on what philosophy or what, what role for philosophy in medical education. So what reciprocal attitude should we have? Um, and then again, a, a, a paper written in 1997 uh, by uh, Bartowski, uh, what some point says philosophy needs to do an internship in medicine. And the proper pursuit of the philosophy of medicine is a critical reflection on the theory and practice of medicine, so them, them both. And, and this, this I always found a very, very nice quotation, and not the bringing of philosophical ready-made concepts to the root presence of the barbarian medical mind. The philosophy of medicine abstracts and reconstructs the topical and universal features of medical knowledge, how it is acquired, how it is transmitted, how it is achieved, tested, changed, how it is used or abused. So basically what we are encouraged uh, to do is to consider a number of different epistemic processes in the construction of medical knowledge, how it is acquired, transmitted, tested, changed, used, abused. And clearly, uh, if this is the, the terrain uh, in which philosophy and uh, medicine basically encounter each other, then a privileged set for intersection is clearly uh, education. That, that is for sure. In this first uh, preliminary part, let me also mention one uh, initiative, uh, which I'm told by friends from, from Britain was particularly relevant uh, there. Um, which was the Nuffield Trust decision in 1997 to raise awareness of humanities and arts, so not really kind of philosophy, strictly speaking, or not only philosophy, uh, contributions to health and well-being. So the first meeting there uh, issued the, the so-called Windsor Declaration, which I am told, but I, I, might, I might have had uh, bad consultants on, on this side, I hope not, um, I'm told that this actually pushed forward some uh, role of also philosophy in the medical uh, education, both in the UK and in the, in the US. Um, and there, basically, what we find is that uh, the, the purpose, I'm reading the quotation at the end of the slide, was to learn about and assess current activities, perceptions, beliefs, and models of effective practice in medical undergraduate education in the uh, UK and in the USA. Um, and basically, what are identified as the principal training needs in the humanities, as I was say, more generally conceived, um, basically, they are, there are outcomes, it says, of medical education for both patients and doctors. So it is sort of seen from both sides. And it also claims that the needs are to improve the delivery of care to patients and to improve the person delivering that care. And this, again, might be a topic for further discussion, also in, in, in the light of what Alexander was 
uh, presenting earlier on today. Uh, I wanted also to quote a slightly uh, other bit from this, from this document because I think it introduces two other elements. And one is that uh, it says it is important to appreciate what is happening currently, and it, it was two decades ago. Uh, we should not attempt to reinvent the wheel through pushing an emphasis on the humanities. It says the social sciences, and we could say the humanities and philosophy as well, uh, already have and, and fulfill an important role. So they were not thinking that they were suggesting something entirely new. And if that was the case back then, then even more so now, actually. Um, but they also say that it is important to emphasize that we are speaking of medical education and not just training. Namely, knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values are all interwoven. Uh, so it means that the ethical and the epistemological side are presented as somehow um, deeply entrenched. Okay, so given this sort of very, very sketchy background to put some elements on the, on the table, um, why should we have philosophy in medical education? So let me start by some, some claims here. Um, I think that the relation, I mean, I, mean, I don't think, it's obvious to all of us that the relation between philosophy and medicine, there has also been much discussion already back in the 70s, uh, philosophy and medicine, philosophy in medicine, philosophy for medicine, and so on and so forth. Um, that has been uh, discussed for, for a while, but actually, um, why has it become so popular and so trendy as a topic in the last few years? I think that one of the reasons is that there have been uh, in incredible, huge changes in the biomedical sciences, extremely fast progresses, which have, among others, also uh, promoted shifts of paradigms. So let me just mention a few. The rise of molecular explanations of diseases, the rise of molecular medicine, and the changes in which uh, in, the, in the ways in which classifications are made and in which diagnosis, prognosis, and therapies are un understood and, and, and practiced actually raise new philosophical questions as well. Uh, there are different ways in which the notion of patienthood is conceived. There are dif different ways in which patients are clustered these days. There are different uh, ways in which algorithms are, are used, and that has an impact on classifications and on diagnosis. Uh, we have a deluge of data in a number of fields in, in biomedicine. The old debate on big data science has been involving very, very seriously and very deeply also the biomedical sciences. Uh, we have the rise of a new field, which is bioinformatics, uh, which has been changing also the way in which the biomedical sciences are done in the lab. Um, another aspect which is very often stressed is the complexity of, of uh, patients and the debate, also the philosophical debate, has been increasing on the so-called complex diseases, such as cancer, which again was mentioned earlier on, or psychiatric disorders or, or others. Um, and patients are complex, uh, both from a, a clinical point of view and also are kind of increasingly complex to, to manage. Uh, the amount of information which is around is, is different, has been increasing. The amount of information patients can have access to on their own has been increasing, um, and so on and so forth. And uh, related to, to, to that, so we have all the debate on precision medicine, individualized medicine, uh, personalized medicine, etc. And the uh, technological progress keeps pushing the limit of what is possible, of what is ethical, of what is unethical, and with all the related uh, deontological dilemmas there. So what role for what philosophy in thinking about medicine and healthcare, their nature, their overall direction and shortcomings? And obviously, I'm, I don't, I'm not claiming that I'm uh, presenting anything particularly original here or making any definitive, uh, definitive uh, claim. I just think that I'm trying to put some, some elements on the, on the table. So I think that what has been happening in philosophy of medicine is very close to what has been happening in philosophy of science more generally uh, conceived. Uh, philosophy of science has been putting increasing uh, stress, increasing emphasis on scientific practice on the ways in which scientific uh, knowledge um, is actually um, elaborated, uh, on, on, on the ways in which models are actually um, designed, and, and so on. 
So basically, um, philosophy of medicine has been doing the same. There has been an increasing attention to the actual modes of biomedical research and of the actual issues in clinical practice. And also overall, I think that the my experience at least is that the collaboration between philosophers of science and people working in the biomedical sciences has been overall increasing. I don't think it's enough yet, but I think it has been overall increasing. So what, what could we do with our philosophical tools? Uh, philosophical insights, uh, I think, can be used as critical tools to promote methodological uh, clarification, conceptual clarification, criticism of assumptions. I often have pretty extensive discussions with my colleagues in medicine uh, regarding the models they, they use when they, they talk about diseases. Um, we can use our philosophical tools to uh, revise previous concepts and to formulate new ones given the, the progresses. And we can use philosophical tools to analyze ethical quantities. And the literature on, on this has been uh, increasing. We have a number of pretty significant papers uh, published also, also recently. The point is, I think, that the role of philosophy and the, 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 the challenge here, and this is what I would like to, to stress, is that the role of philosophy of science for the sciences and eventually the role of philosophy of medicine for the biomedical sciences uh, needs to be advocated not on the basis of some peculiar intuition that philosophers themselves might have given our uh, field, given our background, given our uh, affiliation. So the, the, the role of uh, philosophy in medical education should hopefully be defended given the issues and needs arising from within the biomedical sciences, and more specifically, those needs and those issues which cannot be settled just on, on the basis of empirical evidence or empirical studies. Oh, sorry. Okay, so what should be taught to medical students? Oh, sorry. I thought it was. Oh, oh sorry. Here, okay. So, uh, some examples of topics which have been uh, discussed in the recent literature on the benefits that philosophy of science and philosophy of medicine more specifically can provide in medical areas, and some of these, not, not all of them I think, but some of these have already been mentioned this morning, um, have to do with, for instance, the nature and the conceptions of health and disease. So what, uh, what count as a disease or what count as an illness or what count as sickness has been changing. Uh, it can change in history, can change throughout different social contexts. Uh, conditions that were not regarded as diseases uh, nowadays are, and, and vice versa. And for instance, these issues are particularly uh, thorny when we talk of mental disorders. And um, a number of medical doctors are quite interested in these kind of issues. So we have to spell out normative criteria, what defines health, disease, disability, personhood, welfare. welfare. Um, and we, we, we might engage in discussion between the naturalistic and the normative side, but then all the relevant issues which have been discussed have to do with too much medicine, uh, disease mongering, and, and, many, and many others. Uh, but philosophy can provide also um, very relevant tools with respect to discussion of the foundations, for instance, of uh, statistical inference, the theoretical foundations of probability. Uh, there has been, um, and, and, and there still is, a lot of debate on the, in, in the philosophy of experimentation on the repro reproducibility and replicability of results, the uh, design of, of uh, trials, and, and, and so on. Uh, medical epistemology widely conceived uh, what, count, what counts as scientific evidence, what is the best evidence, how is evidence to be evaluated, what are uh, bias and errors, how can we avoid them. The hierarchies of evidence were already mentioned by Alex. The different kinds of evidence, mechanistic evidence, probabilistic evidence, etc. Et Oops. Okay. But then we also have other tools which can be uh, extremely relevant and they have to do with reasoning and decision making. So we might be uh, engaging with medical doctors in discussing what diagnostic reasoning should be about. Um, we might have something to say with respect to reasoning policies, with respect to current uh, correct argumentation, both in research environments and at the bedside, etc. And I also think that 
the uh, philosophy which is relevant for medical students had to do with ethical issues. Um, Alex, I, if I got it right, uh, was slightly critical on, on, on the role of uh, ethics and, and, and bioethics. So let me mention also that the way in which I see it might have to do both with the, the uh, belief that I, have, that I strongly have that um, addressing conceptual and methodological issues in a given way rather than another uh, very often has very um, clear, direct and strong ethical implications. So the way in which I, I conceive something, the way in which I conceptualize something, the way in which I carry out uh, an inquiry might have very kind of thorny and, and, and ethically sensitive aspects. And the other way around. Um, and very often when I, when I hear my colleagues in ethics and in bioethics discussing a number of issues having to do with personhood, beginning of life, life end, etc., uh, many of them um, need to have and are, 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 very, are very willing to have also some philosophical um, underpinning in the sense of conceptual uh, clarification, also through the tools which are provided by philosophy of science. And also let me mention another um, matter which might have to do with the fact that, that I believe that ethics uh, does and, and, and should play a role here um, has to do with the, the, the way in which we practice bioethics, at least in, in Italy. Uh, most of it comes directly from moral philosophy, um, but also a very large amount of works in ethics and bioethics is very strongly intertwined with philosophy of law. So a number of issues are actually um, addressed in a very kind of entrenched and, and, and integrated way between um, moral philosophy and philosophy of law. And that's where bioethics actually comes from, at least in, in, in my country. So if we have to do with ethics, we might, for instance, have to uh, address issues uh, dealing with integrity rather than fraud, uh, misconduct. Um, and these two issues, for instance, are recently in a portion of the debate have been very strictly related to the replicability, reproducibility of results that I was mentioning earlier on. So as a clear case in which the, the, the two are quite closely uh, related, um, issues have to do with consent, conflict of interest, ethical analysis in the use of biotechnology, precision medicine, etc. Um, so I really think that the conceptual, methodological and ethical analysis um, have to go together uh, very often they luckily um, already go pretty, pretty uh, strongly together. And it's not just a theoretical exercise, I think th this also gives us some uh, responsibility. And it has to do with the ways in which we deal with the diseases, uh, both from a clinical point of view and from a sort of um, research point of view. I think that again Alex was making at some point some distinction, was, was, was drawing some, some, some difference between uh, becoming a clinician and, and, and working in a research context. I think that some issues are relevant both ways. And also, um, it gives us quite some responsibility because having different methodological and conceptual tools can also help in dealing with the disease when you communicate the evidence, the probability, uh, the, the, the ratios, the survival ratios, etc., to the patients. Uh, what we should do, and what we are, what I think is one of the most challenging things, is that we should teach, when we teach philosophy to medical people, to medical students, um, we should teach what is needed and not what we are experts in. And later on, I got a slide in which I, I show that um, I don't think that understanding what is needed is uh, easy to, to, to start with. That can already be um, a challenging task. Uh, but we should uh, at least try to link the content to what we teach in medical uh, education to the everyday medical world of the students. Um, I think that when we discuss medicine in medical education, we have at least a triangle. So we should think about philosophers, we should think about scholars, researchers, colleagues in medicine, and we should think about the students uh, as well, who are the people who actually, I mean, all of us who teach uh, philosophy to medical students know that they have to confront and, 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 to, and, to, and to face um, students in, in, in medicine. Who often, uh, I think, have pretty different features from the colleagues in medicine we are used to uh, deal with when we, for instance, carry on our research or, 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 or write our papers on uh, with, etc. 
So once uh, Martin Evans said philosophy of medicine asks questions about the questions medicine asks, and this is clearly one of, of the challenges. So trying to be to the point with respect to what they think they need. I think that Pekka is here with us today, or at least I think he, he, he was this morning. Um, I picked this uh, quotation, so um, in a paper written in 2000, oh, Pekka, if I remember correctly, is a person whose first background is in, is in medicine and, and then he built up his background in uh, his, his knowledge in, uh, in philosophy and he teaches philosophy to medical people. Uh, whatever the form of teaching, some of the content must be linked to medicine. And I always like this, um, this sentence, uh, we should not enter the class and, and, and have this sort of attitude, Can, uh, Kant said this uh, and Schopenhauer said that. Uh, that sort of lecture without any obvious connection to anything else that the students are actually studying is not really um, going to take us very, very far um, from, our, from our philosophy to their medicine and back. Oh, sorry. Okay, so this was, these were some of kind of theoretical reflections. Uh, what are things actually like? What is, what is the current situation like? Um, I must confess that I didn't find any systematic work, uh, any systematic review about what the situation is like in, in, uh, in Italy. Maybe it's high time we, we build on one. Um, so I, I, just, um, I just found one paper which was written in 2019 on the situation in Italy and some in some on Spain. And then I tried to pick up some information on, the, um, on some of the major universities in Italy, which are well known also for their medical schools. And let's see what, what we find. Um, so this, this paper was uh, written one, one year ago, and it was a, a review of the curricula of the Bachelor in Medicine in Italian and Spanish universities. Um, roughly 80 universities were analyzed what was considered were first degrees in, in medicine in 2014-2015 uh, uh, and then 15-16 in, in Italy. Um, and the result um, could seem quite encouraging in the sense that all of them included at least one subject with humanities. Uh, most frequently, the, the, the winners seem to be history and then philosophy, anthropology and, and literature. History was mainly history of medicine and philosophy mainly uh, bioethics, with some uh, differences in the sense that history was, was more prevalent in Italy, and it still seems to be the, 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 the case from the data I collected as well. Um, and uh, philosophy seemed to be slightly more um, sort of uh, appealed to in, in, uh, in Spain. And subjects on philosophy offered were mainly in the domain of ethics. So we got bioethics, medical ethics, clinical ethics, clinical bioethics, medical deontology, and professional deontology. And an interesting um, task would be to really tell the, 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 the difference in medical uh, education between, between them. So this was uh, the, the, the table they provide in which one can see the percentage of courses in the different humanities uh, provided. If we zoom on the Italian situation, the, um, frame, the, the scenario which appears is not very encouraging, I must, I must say, uh, which is clearly uh, very, very sad for me to start with. So let me start from my own university. Uh, what we find is that if we look for, for the coming year at uh, the degree in medicine and surgery, which is a degree delivered in Italian, we have history of medicine, just one credit in the first year. We don't have anything in the second year, and we have a course which is entitled Drugs and Bioethics, which is one credit in the, in the third year. And uh, the, the, the strange course you find near the credits, it's MED02 uh, and M MPED01, are the codes which identify the discipline in which the course is delivered. So history of medicine uh, belongs to a medical discipline here, and drugs and bioethics are delivered by somebody working in uh, pedagogy, uh, education studies. Uh, if we take the, um, this from, from, I think, a, a couple of years, we also have a degree in medicine and surgery, which is basically the, the mirror of the main one, but that's delivered entirely in English. And we find slightly difference there. I'm not sure why. That, that should be interesting uh, as well to, to, to understand. So we have uh, first year ethics, 
which is together with behavioral sciences, and that belongs to psychology. And if one looks into the, uh, the, the, the syllabus, that's basically uh, foundations of neuroscience. And then we have medical ethics in the last year, and that's basically settled within forensic medicine. Uh, so I, I hope, I mean, I, I find it quite uh, curious, and, and, and I, okay, I, I just present it as, as it is. And we don't have any, we don't have anything as philosophical here. But Bologna offers a number of other degrees which are medicine related in a way, but they are not the sort of main degrees which will make the future physis physicians themselves, okay? We have bachelor uh, degrees in midwifery and in nursing, and there we find bioethics. But then again, bioethics belongs here to forensic medicine or to nursing, clinical, and pediatric sciences. We have again ethics and, and, and bioethics in the bachelor in biomedical laboratory techniques. We have epistemology, and that's taught by me, in a master's degree in professions of prevention sciences, and that's uh, four credits, 24 hours. We have philosophy of language, which is um, delivered in the Bachelor in Speech and Language Therapy, and that's two credits. And we have philosophy of science, hurra, uh, which, is, which is taught by me in uh, the specialization course in cardiovascular diseases. And that's just uh, eight hours. And for them, that is their basically eighth year. So they, they have uh, a first degree, which lasts um, six years, then they got four more years, and in the second year, they meet for the first time some philosophy of science. Let me very quickly move on to some other uh, universities. Florence, we have just at the first year for credits, um, 48 hours, that's compulsory though, and humanities is made of bioethics, general psychology, health and prevention, and history of medicine. Naples, we have some bioethics, it's two credits the first year, and it belongs to a course which is called the um, Foundations of Medicine and Clinical Ethics. And then they have um, something else, which is Clinical Ethics II, uh, which is delivered by internal medicine and neurology. So, um, Padua, Padua actually had a very long tradition until 10 years ago of medical doctors. Maybe some, some names might sound familiar to some of you. Uh, there were Giovanni Federspi, Cesare Scandellari, who wrote um, kind of major textbooks on uh, the methodology of clinicians. Um, they disappeared, I mean, they, 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 they died 10, 10 years ago, roughly. Um, and now what we have are, is just history of medicine in the uh, medical school. Romana Sapienza, again, we have two credits in bioethics within a course which includes a number of different ways. Uh, and then we also have uh, two credits, which is good, in uh, logic and epistemology, a clinical decision, uh, and um, evidence-based medicine, basically. And then again, ethics and moral philosophy. Turin, first year, one credit of ethics elective, second year, one credit of ethics elective, and then evidence-based medicine and bioethics together, compulsory, but only uh, in, the last, in the almost last year, in the, in the first year out of six. So, um, what, what is the situation like? What, what, what sort of uh, impression do we get? It's very heterogeneous. We have very few philosophical courses and most of them are in bioethics. Uh, they are very fragmented. We find them very scattered in, in, the, in the curricula. They present very few credits and very, very few hours. Most of them are not actually evaluated. Many, many of, the, of the courses do not have an exam on the road, so the students will not be assessed for that course. Most of them are in the first year, most of them are elective, and often what we can observe is a lack of academic independence, in the sense that we have philosophical contents, mainly actually bioethics, included in another subject, and actually in many different subjects, so it's really different, uh, difficult to understand um, which sort of logic underlines the way in which bioethics or philosophy are placed within different uh, disciplinary contexts. So what is missing? Uh, what educational strategies could be uh, envisaged? I mean, clearly the situation of philosophy in medical education in Italy is quite um, depressing, if I, if I may. I mean, somebody, I mean and, um, Juliet was, was talking about struggling. I think that we are also struggling, maybe in, in different ways, but it's, it's, still, it's still struggling. 
Um, I think that we should promote the intertwinement of philosophy of medicine and bioethics in addressing actual case studies, and this is something I already mentioned. But I also firmly think that uh, if we want to uh, promote philosophy in medical uh, education, we cannot really think that we philosophers just join uh, somehow the medical schools by teaching our single course in, uh, in, in philosophy. We need to think about, we need to envisage to, 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 to elaborate some new multi-professional approach with a network of lecturers, educators, tutors who share their experiences and their expertise. And I think that we need to um, find some ways of, for um, planning together, designing together, and delivering together the curricula and the, and the courses. From my experience, what happens is that people in, in, the, in the School of Medicine devise their uh, curricula, and then at some point, if they have put some philosophy, they might involve some philosophers. But I also think that for this to, to, to work, uh, we philosophers should also be reciprocal into, into this. So I, I will mention some experience in a, in a moment. Um, we should also think about um, introducing more, I mean, introducing some, because we, we, we don't have any so far, um, some course in, maybe some, some basic course, some, some, some first year course in uh, biomedical sciences, biology, and some discipline in, uh, in medicine for philosophy students. That's gonna, that's, I think, is gonna be the, the, the crucial uh, bit of the story. Then we should also uh, argue that philosophical courses should be compulsory, not elective, and distributed in, in time throughout the whole course of studies. What we have is philosophy for the first year, most of the time, and that's it. Or first and second year, and that's it. And my experience is that if you engage students with discussion at the beginning of their career, they will get some philosophical tools which will then sort of they, they, they will carry on with them throughout the, the courses. It's extremely, I mean, the course I deliver to students in uh, cardiovascular diseases who are at their eighth year is kind of the toughest stuff that I have ever taught, okay? Because their, 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 their point usually is, why are you teaching us this stuff? We use protocols. We don't care about the methodological foundations, the conceptual foundations. We have been trained, not educated, we've been trained uh, in using protocols, and that's sufficient for us. They, they work great. Uh, we use protocols, and that saves us from any sort of suing. And once we're fine, because we're not sued, then we are fine, period. Okay. Um, so I, I, I just put a, a, a quotation here to make my point by Stancy, uh, 1999, uh, and there he, he says, students in, in a Britain survey reported that they, um, I, I got the, the I got my, my face on, on, my, on, my, on my slide. Uh, they got the impression that ethics is a peripheral subject. When asked about what they are taught about ethics, they said, well, you get the odd lecture, but it is usually so showed in the end somewhere. And that's, again, not going to help the uh, philosophical education of medical students. Again, we should uh, insert philosophy in continuing professional education. So it should, it might be some, I mean, I, I don't know what the system is like in other countries, but uh, our uh, physicians have to do some sort of periodical uh, courses throughout all their career when they, when they practice as um, physicians. And they have to acquire credits to keep on being uh, recognized physicians in the public health system. So why don't, why, why not thinking that some uh, philosophical tools could be useful there uh, as well. And then I also think that it's actually quite wrong to think about, to, to, to um, reflect, to uh, consider what the role of philosophy for medical education so widely conceived uh, could be. Because my, again, my experience is that uh, different philosophical courses might really impact very differently in different sorts of medical professions and, 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 and specialties. Whether one is going to become a clinician or a research is going to make a difference, but also whether one is going to become a genetist or a psychiatry is going to make a great difference with respect to the topics uh, is he or she is interested in, but also with respect to the tools to study. I mean, provided that is, it is always going to be sort of a minor subject for, for, for them, um, we might, we I think, must be extremely careful in considering what we are delivering to whom. 
Okay, a, a cardio surgeon, from my experience, is a, a person who has extremely different interests and, and, and needs with respect to somebody, for instance, who is becoming a public health expert. And then, and this is, is going is to lead me to the, my, my, some of my final points, um, we should monitor courses. We should be extremely sensitive to what uh, medical students think about stuff which is delivered. And we should try to involve medical students themselves in presenting relevant cases or stuff they find as problematic. So we should try to tailor the topics to the interests and needs of the students, and we need to identify and evaluate those beliefs and values that medical students find themselves problematic. And here, just very, very into, into brackets, uh, as I was saying earlier on, it is very difficult actually to understand what they think they need. So from the, I mean, usually my courses are evaluated quite nicely. I, I don't have big issues here, but let me just read a few quotations from the evaluation of the, basically the, the same course, okay? So some of them would say, I like this course for its interesting topics, for the way in which they are critically addressed, and because they are very different from those we are used to in uh, addressing in our, in our degree in medicine. But then the same course, I think the topics are not interesting and too distant distant from what we are used to focusing on. And then you would have something like, I like this course because it allows us to get a deeper understanding of what the scientific method is about, which clearly this person believes is relevant. But then the same course, I hope this course will turn out eventually to be, to be useful for me at some point, but honestly, I am not sure it will. I mean, in Italian, it, it, it sounds, I, I doubt it will, okay. So it's really, really um, difficult to engage medical students, I think, most of the time, or at least some, some of the time. Um, I think I'm also, I'm sort of, how much, I, I got ten, 10 minutes or less than that? No. More than that? You've got that, you've got 10 minutes, definitely, yes. 10 minutes, okay. So very, very quickly here, because I want to focus on the, on the last part, with, which might be the, 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 more, the, the, the most controversial, we also have some virtuous experiences we, we try to have. So for instance, in uh, Milan, there has been a PhD program um, for roughly one, one decade, which was called Foundations of the Life Sciences and Their Ethical Consequences. And what was happening there was that actually, um, it was a PhD program in philosophy offered by a strictly scientific institution, which, was the, which is the European School of uh, Molecular Medicine, established within the Institute of uh, Molecular Oncology. And what, uh, was, what, what happened there was actually that some, ethical, some, some ethics and some philosophy of science uh, went together with much work um, by philosophy students into the labs. So the, the educational aim there was to create highly skilled scholars in philosophy concerned with biomedical research and clinical practice, but basically making philosophy students and people and, and students or very young scholars working in cancer research working together. And that was an extremely successful experience because it actually uh, brought the, the, the two fields together in the same labs. And so, and, and at the same time, that institution was um, connected to an oncological hospital. So what was discussed between researchers and philosophy students in the lab then turned out also into a discussion and consultancy work um, with cancer patients in the nearby hospital. So actually that was a way to bring the three sort of hearts uh, together. Another experience which is quite exceptional, unfortunately, in, in Italy right now is uh, the leader in Ferrara uh, since 2016. And there um, we've got um, philosophy uh, in the sense of, okay, uh, diagnostic uh, methodology, ethics in practice, etc., delivered throughout the, the, the years as a compulsory course. And we also had a very nice experience, which was a winter school in ethics and the earth sciences in uh, Bologna, which brought together both from the lecturer's um, standpoint and the student's standpoint, people in medicine, law studies and uh, philosophy. And that was very, very interesting because it made us create um, this very short course together, agreeing on the curricula, the topics and the methodology. So we had some experiences in which we actually um, 
so that we can work together in uh, building up exper successful experiences of medical education with some philosophy in, in it. Okay, so let me get to the point. Is it just an educational matter? I think that for philosophy, no, the answer, my, my answer is no. I don't think it is something which has to do only with education. I think it's, the, the, the issue is much wider. I think that for philosophy to play a relevant role in medical education, a wider cultural shift has to occur, which has not only to do with medical curricula, but more in general with collaboration and exchanges between scholars in the different fields. So let me quote from a, a recent and quite successful paper by Laplan and, and a number of eminent uh, colleagues in philosophy of science. Uh, they make uh, a number of recommendations there. So make more room for philosophy in scientific conferences. I think this has to do with philosophy in medical uh, education. And I think that the reciprocal should be pursued as well. We should host philosophers in scientific labs and departments, and maybe if possible have um, students in medicine attending our courses, which are, not, which are not necessarily tailored on them as well. Co-supervise PhD students, uh, create curricula balance in science and philosophy, possibly I think also with some medicine in philosophical uh, education, with science and philosophy, and open new sections devoted to philosophical and conceptual issues within science journal. Um, the role of philosophy in medical education is, I don't think it's going gonna, it's gonna, to uh, change, uh, improve, or, or be less, um, less, an effort, less of an effort or a, or a struggle if the, if the shift is, is, not, is not wider. Um, I will skip this bit and eventually we'll get back to, to this, um, because I want to get to, to, to this point. So does what philosophers teach really make a difference? And they want to get to this point and then conclude in, in, a, in a few slides, because I think that my, my point here is slightly different from um, Alex. Um, if I think about the situation in Italy, what we are struggling with is that we are continuously under the pressure of evaluation practices. We are currently constantly uh, evaluated. Our courses are, are evaluated, how effective they are, are evaluated. And on the other hand, um, our medical students are under so much pressure that they want to know, okay, is this useful? What, what use can I make of this? Why, why should I take philosophy seriously, given that for me it appears like sort of an extra burden, which is not useful? What, what am I going to do with this? Again, more than two decades ago, Koppelman was saying um, that uh, developing critical thinking skills could further help students become better doctors. Critical reasoning skills help students learn the force of assumptions, theories, and concepts. And again, philosophical education encourages fledging medical professions to uh, develop thinking attitude, okay, uh, and better evaluate options for patients. And what I would like us to discuss is how, how can we prove um, it is the case? So if, if we want to say that there should be some philosophy or, or that we think there might be some philosophy, uh, in medical um, education. Let's put aside for a moment who is going to teach it, okay? But how, how can we prove that it is useful? And I think that's a, that's a, a problem here, okay? Uh, because this raises a number of, of challenges. I think that we should evaluate the impact of curricula and educational strategies in the short run. So does it make a difference when you are, when you are building sort of your profession as a physician, question mark, and does it have an impact um, in the long run, namely in what in the, in the sort of um, medical doc, in, in the physician or uh, medical researcher you are in your whole career? Are there tools to measure the expected outcomes? How can the curriculum, the learning outcomes be assessed? What, what, what is, I mean, is there something that we can measure in the long run? I mean, we have been teaching um, philosophy in medical schools for quite some time now. Is there a way to collect data which can tell us something about how effective we've been or, or, or we've not been? Okay, have we made a difference or, or, or not? So for instance, if we take the short run, okay, I think that a consensus on the importance of some philosophical training for scientists must go hand in hand with reflections on the structure and organization of higher education and early career processes. And we should question a, a few things. So, would present curricula in medicine allow for the inclusion of philosophical views and, and vice versa? 
how deeply should we need to restructure our curricula to include philosophy, for instance? And this might be a practical constraint. Uh, are some curricula in education worldwide more favorable than others in this respect? For instance, it was extremely interesting for me to hear uh, Julia's talk in this, in this respect. Could some useful lessons be drawn by systematically compare different education systems and, and different training systems? Uh, should more scientific knowledge be included in philosophical curricula? So should we start from our own uh, curricula to educate then philosophers who then later in life will be able to uh, interact more effectively uh, with medical doctors? I mean, I haven't been trained uh, with, with, in, 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 uh, in, in any medicine and it has been very hard for me to start teaching to medical students. Might our philosophical courses help our future students to be better um, philosophy teachers, philosophy lecturers in medical schools. Um, and does philosophy make a difference? I mean, can, can it make a difference with respect to the um, physicians, researchers? What does philosophy and medical education do with early careers? Usually it is the person with an established position within a scientific community who makes the effort to acquire knowledge in a different disciplinary field. Usually I got my senior colleagues in medicine who say I love philosophy and I struggle to engage young students, young medical students in, in, in philosophy. So it, the, the risk is, of, is that of having philosophy as a sort of late career addendum on the decorative edge of a, of a curriculum. So what, what, what might be the impact on the, on the career? And again, things are, are different here. So to what extent uh, with respect to the early career in research context, as a community, as a community of philosophers, uh, do we think it is an advantage for those, for instance, applying for grants, fellowships and early jobs or uh, sorry, early uh, career jobs or research jobs? Um, is that an advantage to have some ethical awareness, some methodological tools, some conceptual tools? Would that make a difference in the, in the competition? Is the additional effort required, given the time, the effort, the uh, energy which is required, the, the, the commitment in terms of access to job placement or, for instance, to research projects? Does it have an impact on, on, on that? Should we, should we devise ways to promote a proper recognition of some transdisciplinary work from the very start of, for instance, research uh, career in, in, in medicine? Um, okay, let me skip that. So can we measure the impact of philosophy in medical uh, education? there's very, very limited empirical evidence. Okay, for instance, it is uncertain whether the students who participate in medical humanities activities will actually become better doctors and whether their patients will receive better care. But the, this quotation also says that where there is no really evidence that increasing the amount of hours in science makes them better clinicians either. So this should be at least symmetric. So what, uh, what about clinical context? Can we prove, and if, maybe the answer is no, but can we prove, and if so, how can we prove that studying epistemology, ethics, methodology would enable medical students to develop a reason, critical, reflective approach to, to, to medicine, with the implications that this would make them better doctors? Um, I think that the, 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 the answer given by Alex was we cannot. I don't know whether we can, but I'm just wondering, and I'm curious to know what, what you think, uh, is there a way to find, to, to collect data after a few decades of discussing these issues? Um, do clinical doctors who had a training also in, in some philosophy, do they make fewer errors later, later in their careers? Um, can we measure patients' greater satisfaction? Uh, can we assess that patients are more, more there's, there's greater patients' compliance? Or are they, do they feel more aware in consent or in deciding when they're physicians also had the training, including some, some philosophy. Or are we, I, in other terms, are, are we ready to surrender and say, well, there's no way to assess the usefulness of having some philosophy in medical curricula, or at least in, in, in the long run, can we think about some correlations? I'm not talking about causal relations between, but at least some possible correlations between later careers and the training that one at some point had. 
Okay, so what should come next? We should reflect over the design of the curricula, the educational strategies, the impacts on the, on the career and the organizational and institutional constraints, which are there and they are very much practical and, 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 and constraining. Um, let me, okay, so I don't think that they should be uh, prioritized hierarchically. I think that organizational, institutional, educational, cognitive and epistemological aspects should be addressed together. And I think that it would be great if we could devise some ways to evaluate and if possible to measure the, the, the benefits in the short run or in the long run, or in the, in the case of research projects, if we could promote um, some advantage in having a kind of more entrenched background. Um, also to, to, to further orient implementation and uh, in, of intertwined reflections and, and training. I think that only by jointly considering research issues, training initiatives, educational curriculum and the other constraints, uh, we could think of reflecting on the relation between philosophy and medicine and providing reflections which might have an impact on the future fate of both fields. Because I really, I, I dream of having some colleagues in medicine delivering courses in medicine for my students in, in philosophy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rafael. Uh, that, that, was, that was super, and, and it really touched on a lot of things that you know, speak to my experience anyway. But let's see, uh, uh, time, we have some time for, for, for questions. Let's see who, about uh, 20 minutes, hands up. Uh, we have, uh, is, is that Anastasios again? So Demopoulos A, so perhaps that's different, that might be different. Yes, who? who? Yes, it's me, it's me, it's me. Oh, it is, okay. Yeah. Oh. Um, uh, th thank you, Rafaela. Um, that was really great. Uh, I was thinking, based on the UK experience, I'm a doctor myself. Is physicians and researchers is also management and leaders also here in the UK. A very important part. And going back to the beginning where you mentioned complexity, and I'm thinking about uh, the, the 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 speed with uh, with which things change and all the emergent properties, I do believe that there is a role for philosophy there, not generically, to, to help actually, you know, create clinicians which are at the same time managers and leaders, you know, that they are able to understand the relevance and emergent properties in a, in a local system, whatever that may be, or in a general system. I mean, I'm, I'm talking now psychiatrist, which has, obviously its own complexities. Um, so, and, and I, I, mean, I saw also that you don't mention phenomenology at all in your talk, which when you go back to your questions in the end about patient satisfaction, I think that that will be definitely, definitely a clear advantage because I'm not talking here about truths and uh, you know, but the phenomenological language can actually be a much better language to address human suffering than a very descriptive, you know, objectifying language. That's, that's my, yeah. So thank you very much. I totally agree with, with all, all, all you said. It was definitely something which was missing there. Again, there must be, there, there, there might be a kind of academic reason there um, because in Italy, uh, phenomenology is always within, I mean, it's most of the times uh, within theoretical philosophy. So I was just focusing on philosophy of science here, but you're totally right, it was, it was missing. Uh, there's much to do on patient experience and phenomenology and illness as opposed to disease and etc. Uh, let me also make another comment here, if I, if, I, if I may. You're totally right also with respect to complexity. And I think, I mean, the, some of the stuff I've been focusing on in the last few years have been cancer on the one hand and psychiatric disorders on the, on the other. On the other. And actually, I've also written a, a paper in which we, we have a colleague of mine was an expert in philosophy of cancer, and we were really at the beginning surprised in seeing how many analogies actually are from an epistemological point of view when you deal with complex diseases, even if they seem they, they, they start with seem, they start off by seeming very different from, from very different fields. Um, so that's definitely something that philosophers should be um, engaging. Um, if I must also had colleagues in, in, in medicine, sometimes even the most sympathetic sympathetic ones 
raise the following objection. They say, look, really like you philosophers and really love to work together. But the point is that in order to work together at different tiers, so cancer research, complexity, psychiatric disorders, etc., we really need to explain you a lot of stuff. And once you finally get there, so once you get, I mean, they sometimes kind of kid, but that's basically their, their, their concern. Once you get enough competent to actually write the paper or do the stuff or be part of the, of the, of the, of the uh, team with us, we are already at the, at the, at the next level <laughs> and we struggle to get you there. Uh, so sometimes their the, the concern is uh, you haven't been trained enough in the sciences to follow us at the pace that we would need you to follow us. And I, I, don't, I don't think there is, I, we sometimes joke on this, I, I don't think there is a really a solution there. The, the only thing I, I can see is that, I mean, we, we should really make teams, but it's really tough for a philosopher to be always at the, at the edge to, to work together on complex disorders, for instance. Great. Thanks so much. Um, my order is we have a question from Gabriela um, and then and then from Alex. Gabriela, over to you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentation, Rafaela. Uh, I'm very happy to see you again. Uh, yeah, I, I'm the one. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> but you should have come to Bologna at some point, yeah? Yes, but it didn't uh, happen because I have I managed, uh, on the other hand, to go to uh, Hebrew. They had, uh, since uh, 2007, a program in medical humanities. And there I was lucky to be, to have an easier uh, uh, procedure. So I was able to, to get there. And now I have a question which is related to the position where I am, because as you know, I'm at the end of my uh, uh, doctorate uh, program at my PhD. I finished, I graduated medicine, so I kind of like to promote uh, medical humanities, including philosophy in medical education. So I am now asked uh, by uh, some uh, professors from the medical school in Bucharest, where I was a student, to create a 10 sessions uh, program uh, in which I will be able to introduce medical humanities to medical students. And I struggle in having to um, decide how am I able in 10 sessions, which means I think 20 hours, uh, to condense so much information. And uh, I think I'm in a desperate situation. So I'm asking you, if you can put uh, yourself in my place, having to deal with a system where nobody, uh, not even doctors, heard about medical education, uh, medical humanities, or maybe too few people heard about this concept and how it can help uh, future doctors to do it. So I struggle with one, create a very condensed program and two, convince other important figures from my university that this course is important to be not just an optional but also compulsory um, course. Okay, to start with, if they already put you in the position to organize something and to deliver something, I think it's a pretty good starting point. So I, I don't think you're a desperate case. I think you're in a pretty good situation because it's something to invent from, from scratch and that sounds quite sure. exciting. So uh, the quick question is, we can fix a Skype appointment and then talk about it at length whenever you want. So just drop me an Thank email. You. Um, the, 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 the answer for the conference is, well, I, I would, if, if I were you, I would start by considering who your audience is going, is going to be. So for instance, I, I, as I was saying, I teach very different kind of people. So for those who tend to um, tell me, well, we've got protocols based on um, evidence-based medicine, for instance, I would uh, give them some papers, some critical philosophical papers on uh, evidence-based medicine. I usually start, for instance, telling them, okay, but you know, do you know where, when, and why uh, evidence-based medicine was born? And they usually do not have any idea, for instance, about the sort of history of the evidence-based movement. They have no clue whatsoever. So they, they just use protocols and, and that's suffice. So I try to start from the point in which they are or they think they are. And then I also, 
also tend to mix some papers in philosophy and some papers from um, medical journals. So if you, if you have in front of you people who are, I don't know, surgeon or cardiologist or, or orthopedics, try to pick some interesting and, and easy cases that they can actually relate to. Other courses, for instance, I, I teach people uh, working on prevention. So I, there I discuss correlation, causation, and risk assessment, because that's something they can relate to uh, more, more, more quickly. So I would always start from the audience you, you have to, and I wouldn't try to squeeze as much as possible. I would, try, I would rather try to make some choices, and then you see how things go, and then the following year you eventually you, you, you get the feedbacks from them, and then eventually you, so. But just drop me an email, and I would be very happy to discuss this further. Please do. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Thanks, Gabriel and, and Rafaela. Uh, Alex, Robert, you're next, and then, then James was next with his hand up. Hi. Thank you, Rafaela. I enjoyed that. I, as you mentioned, I mean, the interesting, one of the interesting things that you said um, for me was this question, should we give up on looking for data, basically evidence to support the idea that teaching philosophy to medical students is, is, is effective in some, for, for some purpose or other? Um, and you said, maybe we shouldn't, maybe we should actually look and, and see. And I, I, I mean, I, I um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think, I mean, it, uh, um, it, it, that's very much sort of uh, in line with kind of where I was starting as well, except that I was thinking probably that we should give <laughs> that we should give up or at least I wasn't thinking um, um, that we should give up but that we perhaps have to define the outcome of interest and I think so the question I have is isn't it a bit isn't it a bit risky to go I mean I agree entirely that you can't just assume that teaching philosophy to medical students is a great idea because I mean I think it's a great idea but that's because I'm, I'm a philosopher so you know and I'm the same for you, for you so we need something objective but that, that then you need I mean, the, the trouble is, what what would that evidence look like? Um, um, you know, and the, the, my fear is that if it is if it is not if that isn't the prior question, then we end up basically with a study on the basically showing that the, the, the teaching of philosophy to medical students lacks an evidence base, um, which I'm absolutely sure it does um, at the moment. Um, and I, I, you know, maybe we should try and assemble one. I just I'm not sure that trying to assemble an evidence base for you know, because not because I don't think there could be an evidence base per se, but because of the outcome. So as soon as you get into that, you, it's it, this is why I go on about the curative thesis. It, it's like you're looking for outcomes. You're looking for the effectiveness of an outcome, whether that's a measurable, a measurable uh, difference in, um, you know, mortality or, or, or you know, year, life years or something. I, I, I guess the question would be. I guess my question to, to you then would be just partly just to invite you to reflect on that when, when uh, but also like shouldn't we sort of um, you know if we are going to start looking for actual empirical evidence that doctors who've studied philosophy are better and ideally not just because they went to better medical school better medical schools but because the actual philosophy did some causal work should, should, should we, you know what, what kind of differences are we looking for um, yeah Okay, thanks, Alex. Obviously, I don't have an answer, but my, my concerns are, are the following. Um, whenever I talk to medical students and I hear them say, oh, well, yeah, you're quite right. I don't have a clue on the reasons why I use this protocol rather than this other one. I have no idea about uh, the, the ways in which they are they have been elaborated or whenever I read stuff about um, I don't know, errors in interpreting statistical data because of kind of stuff that we philosophers of science would pick like that. Yeah. I, I keep on thinking, as I think, again, mo most of us think that some philosophy in medical education should not be an optional. Okay. Right, right. Uh, I, I'm not entering in the debate of who should teach it. I, I think it's, I mean, it's kind of not, not really relevant, but not that important right now. Okay. Uh, but, it's but too germane, I, yeah. But then if I have to convince, okay, my university and universities in Italy that um, it's worth having some more, some, a, a higher number of positions, okay, in um, philosophy in medical schools. I mean, it's something which has a cost. I mean, we, it, 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 is, it is the point in partly that uh, Juliet was, was, was making. So, um, is there a way to um, show that what you're spending then 
you're not spending later on because for instance i don't know uh, the the amount of i don't know of patients who will be more compliant with the procedures because they understood better what the uh, doctor was telling them and and they, and they were they were explained better what the risk was okay um, obviously you're going to just find correlations but i'm just wondering whether given that this debate as i was saying has been going on for a while do we want to keep on having reviews and my, mine was very sketchy and not very nicely done by the way uh, differently from juliet do we want to keep on producing reviews on how many universities um, provide how many courses in, in, in philosophy? Yes, so, so what? No, uh, so I, I don't really have an answer, but... I agree. Maybe, maybe, maybe okay, uh, again, uh, Dimopoulos was, was uh, Anastasius, right? Was, was suggesting that the phenomenological bit should be taken into, into account. Is there a way to collect information, collect evidence, qualitative evidence, by interviewing patients who in the last decade have been, have been having as clinicians people who were trained also with some philosophy? And did they feel more comfortable overall? That obviously, I mean, there's going to be a huge amount of confounders. You're not, you're not going to prove any causal correlation, any, any causal relation, that, that, that for sure. But maybe we should try to um, to risk a little bit, to, to, to try to make sort of jump of imagination and try to see whether there is something more than our philosophical background, basically, which makes us believe that it's going to be really, really useful to have some philosophical training in, in, in medicine. Or other, uh, another, another way which might be, might be easier, um, can we prove that philosoph uh, sorry, that um, researchers in biomedical sciences um, are less likely to make gross errors in the interpretation of statistical data when they publish research papers. Maybe that's something which, I don't know, maybe it's, it's, I, we, we, should, we should, I think we should yeah. get a great yeah. European project on this. And, and, yeah, and, let's get some ERC grants. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I volunteer for that, okay. And, and, and try to devise ways to, to, to show that they, there might, or at least investigate whether we can find some indicators um, hmm. for, for, for that. Uh, a very final thing. For instance, uh, among my students, I've got people who already work in the in the master class, and they work for the public health system. They were involved also in the COVID situation, but before that, they are the people who work in the uh, offices in the the, I don't know, in the in the places meant for vaccination. So basically, they meet also all the people who do not want their uh, children to go through what are now compulsory. Right vaccinations. And they really have a hard time to convey the scientific evidence in the right way to the uh, parents. So providing some tools there might make a difference, also a sort of social political difference, for instance, with respect to vaccination campaigns. So can, can we prove that our job is useful? Maybe there are some, some ways to, to do so. And I think that we should join brains to, to find some. I don't know whether I, I replied, but no, that's helpful. That's interesting. Thank you. Alex, can I just, um, yeah, okay, great. Um, we, I think we could time for one last question, which will be from, from James, who's been waiting patiently. I'm sorry to anybody else who, who wants to ask a question. I'll try and be quick in that case. So one of your slides I thought was particularly interesting where you uh, presented two contrasting sorts of views from, from uh, learning philosophy as part of medical education. On the one hand, people say, well, uh, being asked to think in a, in a different way, it's really stimulating, it's allowed me to rethink medicine. On the other hand, it's people say, well, this didn't seem very useful. And I was just curious whether you thought, well, is it a problem if it turns out that, that some people love it and some people just don't see the point of it at all? Because one thing you might think is that you might think it could have a certain sort of signposting function if there's going to be uh, additional philosophy elsewhere in the degree, or if people, for example, could take a a specialist module in philosophy or even do something like an intercalated year in philosophy. I was wondering whether uh, uh, you might get over the, the fact that some people just aren't and just don't like philosophy very much. It's, it's, it might nonetheless be worth doing. Yeah. Okay, so thanks. Uh, I honestly did not um, reflect very much on that because, um, as I was saying, if, if I want to keep my, my, not really my job because my job doesn't have to do with that, but if I want to keep my hours there, 
I really need to have very good evaluations by the students. So people who say, I don't find that very interesting are a problem for me. So I need to overcome those cases. And this, this is the, the short, um, short answer. Um, definitely, I think that we should work on, on, on the people who have more interests for, 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 for that. Um, you're quite right. It's, it should be, and it clearly is very common to have people with very different reactions, also because that, for instance, is a master's degree. So people to start with come from different backgrounds. They have different bachelor's degrees, and I think that impacts us as well. But then again, we have, at least here, a huge amount of um, institutional constraints. So the amount of credits that one has to take is such and such. The amount of hours that one can take, given the university fees one pays are such and such. So either we invent some more, kind of more, more, more flexible sort of uh, curriculum to, for, for instance, we, we don't have anything like minors. You pick a subject and that's it, end of the story. We don't have major and, and, and minors and we're working on, on, on that as well. So all these constraints actually, I think that are a, a damage precisely for those who say, well, I really think that's, that's, very, that's, very, that's very interesting. On the other hand, if we philosophers, at least here, don't want to lose their hour, their, their, their few hours within medical curricula, we really need to get on board also those who think that's not very relevant. Great, thank you very much, uh, Rafael, for a fantastic talk to the audience for excellent uh, questions i thought that was really really rich and you know the three talks that we've had so far have really you know, broadened i think you know, some of our thinking about this anyway so thank you very much indeed Rafaela. Thank you. Thank you. um and um we will you've got we have 15 minutes to go and get ourselves some tea or coffee um and we'll start again with john from fuller at uh at quarter past the hour